So Adam, uh, I'm going to start with you. Um, you memorably used the phrase economic long COVID to describe what's going on with China's economy right now. Explain what you mean by that. Thank you for having me back on Foreign Policy Live, Ravi, especially with these two other great guests. Uh, the key thing in making economic analysis, I believe, is trying to say conditional on what. Is, is something just a random variation? Is something a change in a trend, a particular incident? And so there's been, since my article came out, a lot of focus on bad data from China. And as you pointed out, there's some very scary long-term data on demographics, on youth unemployment, things Ling Ling and James have written about. I coined the term economic long COVID because I do think we're at a turning point. And the turning point is not just the ongoing slowdown of Chinese growth as they've built the economy and fewer people are moving from the informal agriculture to the urban sector. Economic long COVID, in my view, is what happened after COVID. And it's a persistent drag on consumer and small business behavior. So in the sense not to be too morbid, but that you're sluggish and your immune system is weird as for some people after they've had COVID. Now, why do I make this analogy? First, what puts me onto it is the fact that most other economies, including Asian economies, including the other large economies and high income economies had a real boom when they reopened after COVID. Most forecasters expected such a boom in China. We didn't get that, we got a brief uptick. And then when I started looking into it more, we saw a huge shift of Chinese households, Chinese small business cutting way back on their purchases of durable goods, on their investment, and putting more and more of their savings into savings accounts, liquid assets, rather than just investing abroad. Now, some of that, of course, is they have a real estate problem. But to me, what happened was since roughly 2015, President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party leadership have been more and more intrusive into the Chinese economy. They've been more interventionist in various arbitrary ways. Everyone was aware of the famous interactions with Alibaba, with various tech companies, various moguls. For the average Chinese person or household, this wasn't in their face because if you were unfortunately a Muslim Uyghur, if you were a democracy protester, Yes, the state got in your way, but for an average Han Chinese person going about their business, there was what I called no politics, no problem since Deng Xiaoping. They would just let you get on with your commercial business as long as you didn't do anything political. And suddenly with zero COVID, it's in everyone's face just how arbitrary and powerful the Communist Party could be. Everyone knew that. But suddenly people on one side of the street were in complete lockdown and the other people were not. And this would be made in very arbitrary seeming ways by the party powers. And so this to me has induced, I would call it an immune response essentially of the private sector to government stimulus programs, to government announcements, because they're never sure how they're going to be implemented, when they'll be reversed. Because remember, even when they reopened after COVID, as Ling Ling and James have written about, they initially said, oh, we're going to do this slowly. And then suddenly on a dime, they reopened completely in late November, December. So there's been this series of shocks. And so this going forward, I think, in addition to whatever long-term things are dragging down the Chinese economy and growth rate and whatever short-term problems they have in the real estate sector, I think for the next several years, there's going to be this bias or distortion that the consumers, the small business, essentially the normal people are going to be more fearful than they've been. And that mm. is something we've seen in other countries in Latin America, in Russia, in Turkey, when an autocrat basically walks away from letting commerce take place. Mm. Um, Ling Ling, let me bring you in now. I mean, you, you live in New York these days, but you've lived in China for many years. You've covered its economic rise. You've covered the slowdown of the last few years. Um, some of what Adam's describing is uh, a stifling of, you know, the animal spirits in the economy of consumer sentiment. Um, is that what you see as well in your reporting? Uh, sure. Thank you so much for having me here on uh, Foreign Policy Live. And, um, you know, I also wanted to just really uh, commend Adam for that essay that really uh, triggered a lot of uh, discussion about China's economic slowdown. 
Um, I agree with uh, what Adam just described. And, uh, you know, I do feel like, you know, we are at a turning point for China's economy. You know, China's economy for most of the past four decades has consistently defied economic cycles, right? You know, when some slowdown uh, occurred, the government immediately responded and then, you know, uh, jack the growth out of the funk. So, but now we are um, in a, a period of time when, you know, the economic slowdown is going to be, um, you know, many years to come. Uh, now the debate is over whether or not it's a protracted slowdown, you know, uh, lower growth rates or a more uh, worrisome you know, collapse of the economy, you know, because of the risks we are seeing in the financial sector and property sector. Um, you know, um, Adam talked about the uh, uh, hit to private sector as a result of uh, government's interventionist policy. And I completely agree with that. Um, you know, that's definitely what we have seen over the past few years, especially uh, since 2020. Uh, it really is one measure after another, Alibaba, Tencent, you know, the private tutoring sector, you name it. And most recently, we have seen the kind of a clampdown on foreign businesses in the name of national security. Uh, so all that is, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty um, obvious and, 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 you know, it's very uh, disconcerting. Uh, I would just add uh, that, you know, obviously, um, you know, um, uh, a lot of other issues are kind of long time, many years in the making, uh, especially problems in the property sector, uh, prob problems uh, problems uh, triggered by the kind of over reliance on investment, you know that kind of problem really predated Xi Jinping. Uh, but uh, I do agree that uh, President Xi Jinping probably has played an outside role in creating the situation we are in today, precisely uh, for the um, you know uh, issues Adam raised, you know the hit to pri uh, private sector. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, add a few points on the longer term structural problems that have been, you know, there um, for China for many years, ever since probably, you know, in mid 2000s uh, and, and really escalated after the 2008-2009 uh, global financial crisis after China really launched a massive stimulus program, you know, that led to overbuilding and overborrowing, um, you know, uh, so those problems were already there by the time Xi Jinping came to power in late 2012. And he came to power with a lot of promises, right? And, um, you know, people thought, you know, a lot of people in China wanted a strong leader at the helm, a stronger leader than Hu Jintao. And the hope was not, you know, for uh, to see the kind of uh, control we're seeing today, but the hope back then was finally someone who's strong enough, who's decisive enough, who could push through a lot of uh, changes the economy badly needed, like, you know, remake the economic model to make it more consumption driven, just like the United States economy, and less driven by investment, less driven by debt. So that's the kind of hope a lot of people in policy making circles had, a lot of private business people had. But over the years, we really didn't see that happening. In, you know, in, as a matter of fact, as Adam pointed out, you know, um, kind of backpedaled on a lot of reform uh, promises. Mm. Private sector got squeezed even further. In terms of property, um, you know, Right now, people gave uh, Xi Jinping a lot of credit for finally being willing to take on the sector. But let's, you know, we should lose sight of the fact that the bubble got so big uh, because of the policy he put in place in 2015, 2016, that significantly triggered, uh, inflated the bubble even more. So mm -hmm. in China's policy making 
circles, you know, the property sector was nicknamed honeypot because you can always lean on that sector to boost growth. So and now we're seeing they're finally trying to deflate the bubble. We saw the government trying to cut off liquidity for some over levered developers, but there's no follow through how to mm. help them restructure that, how to help, you know, developers uh, finish unfinished projects, how to help homeowners, those things we haven't really seen seeing much government action on. So I completely agree with uh, Adam on the points he made about the government's interventionist mm. policy that dealt blow to the private sector. And at the same time, we just add there's a lot of long-term structural problems like debt, right. like property, or have always been there. And the government hasn't done really done much to help solve those problems as well. Right. James, let me bring you in. I think one through line I'm hearing uh, between what both Adam and Lingling Ling have been describing is that uh, when you have an authoritarian leader, uh, there is always a risk of that leader overreaching um, and perhaps, you know, not being able to listen to uh, advisors who may have alternate viewpoints or viewpoints grounded in real economic data. Um, but I want to ask you, how likely is it then that she could reverse course uh, or find an alternate path. One thing that surprised me with uh, the COVID lockdowns, for example, is um, just as draconian as it was, um, suddenly he sort of reversed course when I think uh, Beijing got a sense that there was public resentment and anger. Um, so authoritarians can reverse course when they need to. What's your sense of how much they're engaging with these criticisms with the data we're all describing and how how could they try a different path so i'd say with zero covid the reversal came about essentially because they realized that the current policy was literally impossible that the numbers were spreading too fast um called that COVID had broken containment slash um the public resentment had reached a a, a peak and so i think they're capable of changing direction when it's become imp literally impossible to sustain the previous uh, policy, as in this case. And that might happen with the economy. Like it, it might be that things get so bad that there's no choice but to change course. My, uh, the, the worry I have is not so much that she isn't listening to people himself, but that he's created an atmosphere where nobody will speak up in the first place and where the space for discussion around economic policy and especially around the ideological aspect of economic policy has been so constrained and for a long time it was relatively open um, it was very vigorously discussed in the 2000s even in the in the mid 2010s partially because most of the communist party doesn't understand economics and so most of the censors didn't participate in this space or restrict the space because they didn't know what any of these people were talking about um, since sort of the late 2010s or so though we've seen that space really constrict and the ability to discuss these problems openly has become much narrower that's a big problem um it's a big problem in terms of the ideas coming up it's a big problem in terms of um the willingness to tackle hard problems i think a little bit more space has opened up as a result of the crisis this year but some but whether anybody's going to be brave enough to to actually say we got it wrong before or whether you're going to have these kind of framings which is always of course the uh, chairman xi jinping's policy was completely correct up until 2023 and now his new policy which should be this will also be correct um i think there's also genuine political risk to xi i think that his the sense among the chinese sort of elite especially the the upper middle class who are really the bedrock of party support in the cities that he that he's failed has become more and more acute now is there anything that anybody can do about that under a very tightly controlled party and surveillance state probably not but it's something he has to have in the back of his mind and that i think could convince him that he has to give some concessions but it's equally likely perhaps even more likely that he'll double down on this on aspects like the common prosperity campaign which have really re-emphasized kind of um maoist or marxist values um and that he will see any criticism as essentially an attempt to undermine him and so stomp on it even harder mm. 
Adam, uh, you know, a question that often comes up with China is why it can't simply spend its way out of trouble. It's right. done it before. Um, obviously, its debt to GDP ratio now has dramatically risen uh, past America's as well. Um, but what is to stop it from continuing uh, to spend its way out of trouble? So, Ravi, I think there's three things going on. Um, first, in a sense, following Ling Ling and other writers about this, there is diminishing returns. I mean, Japan ran into some of this in the 90s, as did Korea, that, that if you're not doing the most useful infrastructure projects or the most in-demand real estate projects, your spending doesn't get you as much bang for your buck. But I don't think that should be exaggerated too far because as Keynes famously argued, and we've seen, you can bury bricks in the, in the ground and it still creates employment and consumption. Um, so it's there, it's less efficient, but not. A second issue relates to James's points about political matters, that she has a lot of control. He's making decisions with his small group of elite and smaller set of information sources in a certain ideological context. And again, I'm not the expert in this, but I rely on others, but it's very clear from his speeches, you know, about eating bitterness, about toughening things up against welfareism, that he doesn't want to do handouts. He's worried about creating he sounds almost like Reagan in the 80s. He's, he's worried about creating this sort of culture of dependency. Um, and I just want to point out that's not entirely new. If you go back to Ezra Vogel's great biography of Deng Xiaoping, there's long descriptions of how between 79 and 92, Deng was, of course, in charge, but was still going back and forth with, I think it was Chen Yuan, um, the head of the China Development Bank, or excuse me, the head of a lot of economic things. I'm getting confused with his son. I apologize. Um, uh, uh, who was very much arguing, don't do stimulus. It's empty calories, not in those terms. So there's that. And so, but to me, the reason they can't spend their way out right now is because of this economic long COVID. So on the one hand, that diminishes significantly the response of any cuts in interest rates or or subsidies to buy autos, all both of which have been tried recently. Uh, the, the private sector, the, again, I want to stress the households and small business people are just not reacting to it because they just don't want to tie up their money and they're worried it could change or be differently implemented at any time. But additionally, I think this reinforces a tendency which my colleague Nicholas Lardy of Peterson identified a decade ago uh, to put more and more emphasis on credit and spending by the state-owned enterprise sector. And she, I think, I'm just in, interpreting from the outside, sees lack of response to stimulus for the small, normal private sector, uh, is worried ideologically about <laughs> reinforcing bad habits. And so he starts putting more money into the state-owned enterprise sector, into reinforced by the national security concerns that obviously foreign policy writes about a lot, you know, to be self-sufficient, to be not dependent on the U.S. To, but anyway, you put all that together and you get a cycle where she is spending more money to less and less effect and reinforcing the concerns of the private sector. And so it's not necessarily a death spiral, but it is a feedback loop that makes it harder for them to spend out. I just want to add one last point, though. On the pure economics of it, I want to emphasize the rightness of your question, which is as bad as the banking sector problem is, or really the real estate sector problem is, as messed up as local government finances are in China, which our colleagues have written about, they can spend their way out if they decide to and they design it right. They're so far, they're designing it wrong, and therefore it's becoming less and less effective. Mm. Um, we'll come a little bit later to what China should do or what the world should do. Uh, but Ling Ling, um, one thing Adam mentioned about a feedback loop, um, and James also riffed on uh, how the Chinese people seem disappointed and let down uh, by the state of the economy. I want to interrogate that just a little bit more because um, I'm curious whether the Chinese pe people have uh, a broader sort of sense of perspective as well. I mean, after all, A, 
you know, four or five percent growth is still faster than much of the rest of the world, certainly the West. Um, but also when you look at uh, the last four decades, there must be a sense of societal memory of of how, you know, the, the growth model that you've written about in your book that worked so well. Are people ready to abandon that? Are people ready to be angry with uh, the government that has brought them thus far? So when we assume that there is a feedback loop, I mean, are the people really unhappy? Is that a sense that could sustain itself? Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, if there is a one word to describe the mood in China these days among ordinary people, private business owners or, you know, others, the word would be downbeat. Um, you know, we all remember when, you know, James was in China and we're in, based in China and covering the Chinese society and economy, the kind of animal spirit, right? The kind of entrepreneur uh, drive uh, that was, uh, you know, very impressive and unforgettable. So uh, these days, the the biggest problem faced by China's economy really is the lack of confidence. Um, you know, the confidence is really at the lowest level since the uh, late uh, 1970s, uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, launched the reform and the opening initiative. And why is that? It's because, you know, for most of the past four decades, the overarching political agenda has been developing the economy. And the Chinese people knew that, you know, a better life uh, for themselves, for their children would be totally possible as long as they worked hard. There are uh, plenty of opportunities. So that really unleashed this kind of animal spirit, entrepreneur drive that powered Chinese innovation and private investment in China. So yes, the model, the investment driven model really worked for a long time for China because China was poor. They needed a lot of infrastructure. They needed a lot of factories. And then gradually the government also kind of, uh, you know, made way, uh, made room for private businesses, private, you know, individuals to let them flourish. So both uh, factors combined together, that's the result of 40, 40 years of boom. We, we had witnessed the most successful economic story, miracle in the whole world. But now, you know, as James and uh, Adam pointed out, there has been a clear shift under Xi Jinping in terms of the top line agenda. It's no longer development, you know, trumped everything else, but security. So instead of trying to have a good relationship with the West, which really was the core of reform and opening of years past. Now China is more focused on confronting the US and its allies and building up a geopolitically resilient economy against perceived Western threats. So that kind of changing focus has contributed to this class in foreign direct investment, more restricted access to Western markets for made in China products, and all that has really dampened confidence in the economy. You know, that's partly why, you know, people are not uh, expanding investments too much. They're not ex um, consuming uh, too much. So this kind of, uh, um, you know, lack of confidence in China's economy, it's, it's really, you know, in, um, based on our reporting, uh, it has really is um, one of the biggest problems faced by uh, China today. Ravi, could I just add one to what, jump in. what Ling Ling said? Sorry, James. Um, I mean, and I read her and her colleagues reporting, so this is the picture I have. But there, there is a key point that I've tried to make in my article and elsewhere, which I think also needs to come out, which is when an autocrat decides to back off non-intervention or putting it more positively, decides to be more aggressive in intervening in the economy, it's not just the confidence goes away in, in the sense of bad performance necessarily, but that it's almost impossible for the autocrat to say in a credible way, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to do it. And this relates to what James was saying about the, the issues of reputation and, and, and performance for Xi. He, he can say, I didn't make a mistake before. I didn't make a mistake now. But the key thing is, even if he says, we're, we're going back to letting in foreign direct investment or we're going back 
to letting private business do things, it's not credible because he's he he's crossed the line. And that to me is the key part, along with the things Ling Ling said of the Chinese economic miracle, was that from 79 under Deng, basically and through Xi's predecessors up till he takes office in 2013, a little after, they were credible. They held themselves back in the economic sphere. They were, you know, barbaric and autocratic in all kinds of other spheres, but in economics, they held themselves back. And now that she's crossed that line, I don't think people can believe him that he will hold himself back. James, I'm curious how much youth unemployment uh, plays a part in public sentiment. Um, and then linked to all of that, I mean, we have been talking about a decline in foreign investment. Um, but uh, some of that, of course, is it's both ways. I mean, the, there's de-risking uh, as a sentiment on the part of the West. Um, China is focused on security as well. But then surely uh, domestic uh, consumption and domestic demand uh, also has to pick up to, to make room for that. So on youth unemployment, there's a, a very huge and obvious kind of morale crisis among Chinese under 30s, uh, maybe even I would say under 40s. And it's not just the generation that is coming into a dire job market now. Uh, so that you have, you know, youth unemployment of at least 21%, probably higher. It's also the generation that feels that they did everything right, that they strove, that they went through the Gaokao, the, the national examination system, that they put in all this effort, that they did the insane hours and long work culture, and that they're not getting rewarded for it. When we talk about, like, do people think of the past, do they compare it to the past? The truth is they mostly don't. Most people, people, firstly, this generation grew up with a, a uh, developed China, or at least a developed China in the in the big cities where they're, they're mostly from. Um, secondly, people just adjust to the norms of the day. They you you base your expectations mostly on the last few years, not on not on your childhood. I mean, I think of you know um, when I first used the internet in like 1993 or so, and was like, oh my god, this is a miracle. And now, if my Wi-Fi fails for two seconds, I'm furious at the world and everything in it. Um, and it's the same. It's the same in China. That you're after years and years of growth. You're used to growth and the expectations of growth, and you've also made a bunch of economic decisions based on the assumption that you're going to keep growing at eight percent. That you're that things are going to be as good. That things are going to stay good. Uh, people have made personal financial decisions as well as business decisions based on that. Mm. So yeah, with young people, there's a. a, a overwhelming sense of almost despair like um there's and part of that is also that the government has kept sticking its nose into everything to a degree that's sharply different from even the china of 10 years ago and this isn't just that the government has like shut down your business if you're if you were doing like private tuition or um made you go through a bunch of self-examinations in the tech sector it's that like the Communist Party, which you joined because you kind of had to and you thought it was a way of getting ahead, is now making you do like three meetings a week instead of one meeting a month. Um, your favorite streaming shows have been taken off because, um, you know, Two and a Half Men has been deemed ideologically irresponsible. Um, your, your WeChat groups have been shut down. The sense of the government sticking its nose into everything has um, became prominent even before COVID. And as Adam said, with the arbitrariness of COVID itself that really upped the awareness that the, the the government could be in your business at any moment. And for a long time, people kind of thought, well, as long as I don't cross the line and things will be fine. Now, in reality, the lines were shifting all the time and people walked across those lines without realizing it. But now they realize that the lines are just going whoop, 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 and there's no way you can be be safe no, nothing that will protect you from kind of the the eye of mordor that's a great analogy there um adam uh just to broaden this out a bit so china's economy is slowing uh, the prognosis does not look great i'm curious and many of our subscribers have written in with a version of this question um what are the downsides for the world um if china continues to slow down uh, 
a lot, <laughs> but not quite necessarily the direct ones, Robbie, that some people worry about. So there's clearly China has provided a huge share of global growth for the last 15 to 20 years. It's roughly 20% to 25% of the world economy. It's a bigger share of trade. And so if China's growing more slowly, they're taking in less exports like copper from Chile um, and, and inputs from Mexico and Thailand and Indonesia than they were, uh, as well as high level business services and inputs from the US. So that's not fun. Uh, also, for good reason, there's a lot of people who've invested in China, both corporations investing directly and people whose savings uh, from abroad have moved into China. If those are more at risk from political factors or performing less well because of these economic trend dynamics, that makes people poorer on a forward-looking basis, and it means diversification is less effective. Additionally, going more into the foreign policy sphere, there is the risk of China potentially becoming more aggressive. Um, the President Biden has mentioned this a couple of times. Now, my understanding, based on colleagues of mine like Colin Hendricks and others, is that the political science literature isn't all that clear on this. There's a, some empirical evidence of wag the dog that a country that has deep economic problems um, is more likely to be aggressive and try to distract with foreign policy or national security efforts. But there's also an argument that if China's economy is weaker, then maybe they've got less capacity to project power. So it, it's not clear. But the thing I would emphasize most, and it goes to some of the very apt and chilling Eye of Mordor and other discussions that Ling Ling and James made, which is a China that's demographically out of whack because of the one child policy and all the things and the gender selection and all the things that came with that through the years. And that is not meeting the reasonable expectations of their younger employed people or unemployed people. Is a China that's gonna be more closed, a China that's gonna be less innovative, a China that's gonna be less in positive exchange with the rest of the world. And we shouldn't forget that there's been a huge amount culturally in innovation, in business networks and human development that has come out of Chinese exchange in various forms, not just limited commercial forms with, with the US, but with the world at large. And we're moving in a direction where that's becoming less and less available. And that's partly things the US and the West are doing and mostly things she is doing, but it's both. This is a loss. This is a loss for the hundreds of millions of people in China who want more options, more freedom. And it's a loss for the rest of us who don't get the benefit from that exchange. And I think we should look at it from that point of view. I agree. Um, I think we can all agree on that. Um, Ling Ling, I'm curious about um, whether you think there are um, options for Xi uh, that he could exercise in the coming months and how likely it is that he would be willing to listen to alternate points of view, um, alternate economic proposals uh, to fix uh, some of the problems we've been discussing. Is is he open to reversing course? Uh, thank you. Another great question. Well, China constantly surprises, so we can rule out anything or everything. So, um, but in order for China to really have a meaningful course correction on economic policy, the politics has to change. Uh, at the very highest level, um, the, the focus for the party, for the government has to change back to economic develop development, back on the path of reform and opening, Deng Xiaoping, you know, um, uh, started. Um, for now, we're not seeing any signs of that happening. Uh, you know, down to more detailed policies, you know, we need the government to not just talk about supporting private sector. We need the government to actually making, taking specific measures to support the property sector, uh, to the private sector. And in terms of property sector, we need the government to really figure out, you know, have some follow through on their existing policies, you know, how really help the developers restructure debt and allow the losses to be allocated among different stakeholders. So, um, but, you know, for now, we're not seeing any signs of any meaningful course correction happening. 
the biggest reason for that is that you know Xi Jinping is very determined, right? Uh, for him, the biggest priority this is this uh, great power competition with the United States and its allies and partners. Uh, to that end, he has many demands for the kind of resources China has now. You know, it, a lot of people have debated over how much uh, fiscal space China has. Uh, for stimulating the economy, you know, the answer really is not that much, you know, if you consider uh, Xi Jinping's other demands, other priorities, for example, defense spending, spending needed for surveillance, spending needed for Belt and Road and other related objectives, you know, um, all those, you know, things in order to, uh, you know, implement all these priorities, there really not much left for stimulating the economy. And one, um, a, another obvious policy tool China can use, but China hasn't, is you know, handing out cash to households, uh, like what the United States did during COVID. During COVID. One of the most um, well-known economists, uh, Liu Yuanchun, you know, in a very lengthy report, he really suggested the government should hand out a thousand renminbi uh, per household, you know, that may not sound much, but that would go a long way in terms of rebuilding confidence that would make people feel like, wow, the government still cares about the economy, still cares about, you know, development. And that will really help the government turn uh, the economy turn around. But so far, we haven't seen that happening. The focus for their economic policy right now is still letting the government play a central role in terms of uh, you know investment especially in what they call you know clean energy you know high end infrastructure you know digital infrastructure etc and the other uh, component is letting the government reallocating resources right credit and other stuff into sectors that uh, the leadership thinks critical for china's future uh, AI, semiconductors, quantum computing, cloud computing, big data, because all of those things in Xi Jinping's view are crucial in terms of uh, trying to win this great power competition with the United States. So Thank James, you. speaking of uh, great power competition, uh, you're, you, you end up speaking with uh, policymakers in the White House quite often uh, on China policy. How are they seeing this? I mean, on the one hand, it could be an opportunity. On the other hand, uh, a Chinese sharp slowdown, potentially instability. These aren't great things for the world, as we've been discussing. So I haven't heard a lot of worry about instability. And in fact, I've heard some optimism that basically the slowdown puts a shrimp on some of the like um, on some of the ambitions. Like if you're dealing with problems at home, it's in some ways harder to sort of think of foreign adventures and so on. Um, among the hardest core hawks, there's a sort of jubilation, to be honest. I mean, I remember talking with a um, three-letter agency guy um, years ago um, in uh, who was uh, in China um, at the at the embassy there, saying. And it, saying, you know, we should cripple them economically. Like there's been a there's there's been a desire among the hardest core hawks to to do that for a long time. And now that it's happening, and it's mostly not been America that's done it. It's mostly been self inflicted wounds. There's there's a real sense of sort of potential triumph. Um, but I think mostly, I think I would say the 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 default position is caution, just because once you get to that level and once you start to see the sort of intelligence and so on coming in you realize how little we know like even if you're even if you're seeing this you know like top level product of the u.s intelligence system the u.s security system we see such a tiny fragment of china we know so so little in many ways about what's happening in so many parts of the country on the ground and we've known less and less since china began closing its doors more um and you know we've seen people like Ling Ling I think got forced out in 2020 um many other reporters like people who were giving us like fantastic ground level insights um have are gone uh the ability to to see stuff through sort of provincial blogging and commentary and so on has been 
drastically reduced. Uh, the economic data is getting worse and worse. And so there's no, there's no sort of, um, there's a, there's a real, there's a real kind of, do we actually know what's happening question? Like how much do we know what's happening? But the thing is that question applies to the Chinese as well. Like, it's not like there's a hidden sec second set of books that contain all the real numbers in China. Um, there's everybody has their own different sets of numbers and estimates that they get through different through different means that they think approximate the real figures but they but um they're all kind of going through a lot of guesswork about what what mm. the numbers actually are it's a telling state of affairs when two of the people i read frequently james and ling ling uh, are are telling us that uh it's hard to know what's going on on the ground um but adam i'm going to put the last question to you um in your writing um you've also made the the, the point that Washington can take advantage of a Chinese slowdown in certain respects. Uh, explain that. Yeah, and I want to stress, Robbie, thank you. I want to stress that take advantage in a very positive way, not in the triumphalism of some of the hawks that James Rightly was referring to. I think what happens in these kinds of autocratic situations when the leader violates what I call the no politics, no problem compact is people start looking for the exits. Not everybody, not massive outflows, but wealthy people start trying to move their money out and when they can get their kids out. Um, companies start moving production abroad, trying to diversify, meaning Chinese companies and also producers in China. And obviously, U.S. foreign policies had something to do with that. Capital starts flowing out. This is part of why we're seeing the, the yuan be so weak against the dollar in recent months intellectual property if the u.s were to reorient its policies as i put it for a bumper sticks or sticker towards suction not sanctions it would be to both our and the world's advantage because it's it, it essentially puts pressure on xi and the communist party leadership to either accept that there's going to be outflows or they end up like their forebears, the autocrats in the Soviet Union and Latin America and elsewhere, putting up more barriers to try to stem the outflows, which we know then makes people more nervous and more eager to get around them. Um, this also emphasizes that our fight, to the degree we have a fight, certainly our challenge, is with the Chinese Communist Party, not because we have delusions we can take down the regime, but that it's with them, not with the people, not with private commerce. And then it's also better with allies because we're not trying to police them and how to behave vis-a-vis -vis China. We're trying to induce Chinese private sector to do its own adjustment. And the final point I would make as an economist is this is much better for the U.S. economy and for the world economy than putting on the barriers and the tariffs. So mm -hmm. I would encourage and I've tried with less access than James to reach people in the Biden administration to rethink. This is the kind of strategy we used against the fascist regimes in the 30s. This is the kind of strategy we used against the Soviet regime. And to go with the important points you were just talking about, about perceptions, you should remember that we totally misperceived the economic strengths of the Soviet regime until very late in the 80s we totally overestimated japan in the 90s you know it's not that china's falling apart none of us are saying it's collapsing but there is much more weakness there than in the economic sphere that people realized and so we should think about it in a different way mm -hmm.